Let's pray. Dear Lord, we're so grateful that you take us as we are and that you shape us and mold us and fit us to do your work in the world, each one of us. May the words of my mouth and meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. So now this is the last week of James, of studying the book of James. And the book of James is really a practical book that talks about what does it mean to live out this faith that has been instilled in us by the Spirit. And James wants to encourage his community that he's writing to, but to us today, that God has gifted us with so many gifts to be about doing ministry in this daily life that we live. James calls upon the royal law, the law of Jesus' love in the world that could be expressed in love your neighbor as yourself. And we may know that familiar saying, but it's really hard to live out because of this sin that is part of us. So James is talking about practical faith. For instance, he says to those who gather in their worship assembly, don't pay more attention to the rich people who wear fine clothes or are in positions of power. You know, make sure that you're not overlooking others with the gifts that they have to bring, but treat everyone equally. And then he says that um, faith without works is dead. That's probably the most famous quote in the book of James. Faith without works is dead. Meaning, if you have faith, what difference does it make as you live your life? As you walk out of the door in the morning, what difference does it make that you are marked with the cross of Christ forever? Your words, your actions, your attitudes, what difference does this faith make? And how do you serve God's people through it? James also tells us, as we heard last week, that the wisdom of the world, and we're inundated with that wisdom all day long, all week long, that the wisdom of the world will not be what fills us up and gives us peace and healing, but that it is only God's presence, it is only God's peace and God's wisdom that will heal what ails us. So today, at the conclusion of his letter, he's reminding the church, us, that although we are imperfect as the church, we are to be a healing and caring community, that that is our role. Such a community, he says, is not to be all about lofty exercises of philosophy or logic, to entertain, but rather to use the gifts that God has given for the care of community. Now, one of the greatest gifts that James lifts up in his letter is the gift of prayer and the power of prayer. So he begins the section before us with some questions. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? Now, the translation we use in worship, the NRSV, the words suffering and cheerful are slightly different in the understanding of the Greek. It offers, Greek always seems to offer a deeper understanding. The word for suffering in Greek is pathos, and it refers to suffering for the persecution of the faith but also anything that causes distress, sorrow, depression, ill health, family issues, social, economic issues. I think the people affected by Hurricane Harvey could tell us what the word pathos means because they have been living it and will live it for years to come. The contrasting word to pathos is thymos, which is translated here as cheerful, but has 
a more holistic sense of all is well in my soul. You know, I'm feeling good inside. And he says, well, then you should sing hymns of praise. And the third image is about physical sickness, um, mental illness, you know, any kind of sickness or body infirmity, whether short or long range. In some, the author's trying to say, do any of you have any issues? And if you have issues, you should pray or you should sing. And that's part and parcel of our worship, isn't it? So James has this vision of the church that includes prayer, that includes singing, and includes being there for one another. Presence. Meaning that we encourage one another as we gather in worship, as we work together in small groups or other projects. We encourage one another. And we are strengthened and healed as we celebrate the sacraments among us. Now, James believes that the church has the power of prayer and that it is a promise not only for the by and by in heaven, but it is a hope for the community now. So I was thinking, how does Holy Cross, how are we um, a healing community? And, and how do we use prayer? But first we have to think about, that James says that prayer is not just private. Prayer is also communal. And um, a lot of people struggle with community this, these days. I mean, Facebook can tell you how many friends you have, and it can tell you how many likes you have, but it is not, you can even be part of a community, but it is not the community that heals us. It is not the community that helps give us life. Now, when people go to Hephatha, they tell me, oh my gosh, their prayers are so incredibly powerful. They pray for everything. They pray for people who are dealing with addiction. They pray for people who are incarcerated. They pray for people going through divorce. They pray for, you know, everything. Because the community of Hephatha believes that the power of prayer can make a difference through the most difficult times of life. And they support one another through those prayers. They do let it all hang out. We in the Burbs, uh, we kind of hold everything pretty close, don't we? I wouldn't want anybody to know that my loved one is in treatment. Heaven forbid you would find out that my loved one was in jail or that my marriage is on the rocks, or that I'm dealing with this illness, or I have this addiction. We hold those things very, very privately. And that's a person's prerogative. But if we don't know what ails one another, how can we pray for one another? How can we pray for one another? And yes, sometimes people have been guilty of using prayer or prayer requests or prayer concerns to gossip. But prayer is holy. And prayer is something that makes this community closer as we connect to God in what is most tender in our lives. So Hephatha, they risk, but they so believe in the power of prayer and that their darkest days and nights and embarrassments and questions can be shared because God holds them in prayer. But we tend to be a little more professional about it all, don't we? And so we have a way, perhaps, to grow in our understanding of prayer and how prayer can bring 
healing that the world doesn't bring. So, James wants the church, albeit imperfect, to be a place where people can bear one another's burdens, a place of healing and community. So I was thinking, how do we do that at Holy Cross? How do we do that? Well, we pray for each other. We have the formal prayers of the church when people share with us a concern or a need or an illness, a hospitalization. Remember, we don't find out about it, HIPAA, you know, we don't find out about it from hospitals anymore. It's only if you share with us can we know that there is illness or surgery in your midst. We have a prayer chain. A prayer chain is simply uh, that prayer requests are given to our prayer chain coordinator, Nanette Smith, who kind of weaves them together in these beautiful prayers, and then she emails them out to us. And they are kept confidential, and you can pray every day with those prayers. You can pray once a week. But those are one of the ways that we lift up prayers. And regularly, we don't know who we're praying for. It might be somebody's aunt in Alaska, but the power of prayer is there. We have prayer shawls. This ministry is so amazing, and it really has brought hope and healing to many as they feel the church surrounding them in their time of need. And now these prayer uh, squares, you can have it go with you. And if you're going to court, put it in your pocket and know that you are not alone, that God goes with you. We're confidential, but with permission, we also get the word out. I don't know, for me, especially when it's children, especially when it's children, I need you all to be praying when our children are sick or have been wounded or hurt. We need to lift up and know so that we can pray for one another. Some people in prayer take the next step. Prayer moves them to action. They might pick up the phone. You know, oh, I heard so-and-so prayed for. I haven't talked to them in the longest time. They might send a text thinking of you, praying for you. And then there's uh, some folks have prayer lists. I was pleased to hear um, Vicar Hans. He's returning from Israel this week, by the way. Um, Vicar Hans said the other day, he said, no, what was that name again? I need to write it down on my prayer list for my morning devotions. So, you know, you might have a list that you put on your mirror in your bathroom as you're blowing and drying your hair, or in a, the novel that you're reading that week, or in your Bible, um, wherever the case may be, but to formally prompt yourself to pray. And then there's a lot of little conversations. Coffee conversations often are surrounded by life's joys and life's sorrows. Um, hallway conversations, parking lot conversations, uh, supporting one another. Perhaps um, some of my best ministries done in the grocery store. When I run into people, you know, how's it going? Oh, haven't been to church for a while, but this has been going on. And so being able to take the time to listen and to listen honestly, to sometimes go beyond the, oh, things are fine. Small groups. Our choir is a small group. They regularly lift one up another in prayer. Our women's Bible studies called circles, they do the same. There are our youth and our confirmation groups to offer prayers for one another. Small groups get to know each other and make a big church feel smaller so that you can share what is on your heart. We have caring companions, people that take these uh, little black boxes, if you're wondering, they're communion kits. And under Pastor David's direction, they go out to members of our congregation, and because the church, they can't get to church, the church goes to them, and they bring the prayers of the church, 
they bring Holy Communion, the presence of Jesus. Pastor David visits our homebound. Ellie is visiting adults over the age, we just picked a number, over the age of 55 for no reason. Just, how's it going? Yet just to be present with people. I do most of the hospital calls and a lot of the other emergencies, and Vicar Hans is kind of doing all, a little of everything. And then there are those times, as well as the rest of the staff, who all do pastoral care in one way or another. Then there are those conversations that are the hardest of all. When you have to share with a family member, I am worried about your drinking. I'm worried you're working too much. I'm worried that you need to go to see the doctor about that. Those are sometimes difficult conversations, but that is also where healing can begin. You may never hear of some of the people at Holy Cross that are going through difficult situations, but we still, as staff, or just myself may know, and we pray on behalf of the whole congregation for those private, uh, difficult situations. Then there's Stephen Ministry, where we have eight caregivers who offer God as the cure giver in one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, we, part of my job, I think, is to be a connector. So when someone tells me they have been diagnosed with breast cancer, I try to connect them with another woman who has breast cancer, or if somebody's going through a divorce, I try to connect them with somebody who's going through a divorce. We help one another in healing. Chris, our volunteer parish nurse, is a great listener. She takes blood pressure checks every second weekend. We have healing prayers. We'll begin again the third weekend of every month. Prayers to share with us that are on your hearts. We have Blue Christmas. Boy, is that a healing service. For people who are going through the blues, who are having a difficult time during those holidays, those holy days, we kind of lament together in the hope of the Christ child. We have volunteers who send out get well cards, thinking of you cards. We have funerals. It's part of healing. We have funerals that are healing and sensitive and proclaim the good news of the resurrection. We have social ministries. We put our prayers in action. We buy goldfish crackers. <laughs> we go down and we help in a project. We do work at the food pantry, all different ways that we put our prayers in action. And this week it may be writing a check for someone who has lost everything. Because, thank goodness for the larger church, we couldn't help that great need, but 9,000 congregations working together can make a difference joining with everyone else who is working. So now there's a question, though. You talk about prayer. I can almost hear you asking it. What happens when our prayers aren't answered? That's really hard. It's really hard because we, we may get an answer that we don't want, or it may be 10 sometimes longer years that you look back and you think, oh, that's what God was doing. Or it may be a rough time that actually lands up having you go through a difficult time that that prayer is answered. Sometimes that is the hardest question. But make no mistake that God hears your prayers and answers them in the way that is possible. Another hard question is for those of you who have family members and children who have turned to the wisdom of the world rather than to the church, that you've raised them here in this place, and yet they don't seem to want to come back. 
I know many of you have heavy hearts about that. Don't give up on praying. Don't give back, give up on praying. And don't give up on inviting. Inviting in different opportunities. Hey, why don't you come to the block party with me? You know, those kinds of opportunities. And then there's those prayers that we've prayed for those who are sick, and they die. They die. Has God not heard our prayer? Or is it that our prayer indeed has been answered because healing could not happen this side of the grave and that it is only through death and resurrection that that person could have that final healing that only Jesus can give. And we also need to give credit where credit's due. We pray for a lot of health situations, and then sometimes we forget to give thanks to God for how God has worked and answered our prayer, except it's a woman in a white lab coat, or it's a surgeon performing a transplant, or it's someone who has given blood. All the modern miracles of science that God has worked through to bring health and healing. James wants us to know that we have power as Christians, that we wear the sign of the cross on our brow, and that we have been given gifts. James wants us to have this faith be expressed, not just kept privately, but to make a difference in our words and actions. And James wants you to know that you are a person who can bring healing to others. It's just not other people. It is you who can bring healing to others. Through your words, through your actions, you can be a healing person in someone's life. So pray this with me, my friends. As I say a phrase, please say this or pray this. I am a healing person. Jesus works through me. Through my life, of love and compassion. You are. Amen.